Hello, it's Jake here. Welcome to part two of our discussion about unjobbing. In this episode, we talk about experiences with applying the idea of unjobbing in our own lives, um, both in terms of the barriers that people have experienced, um, some progress that people have made, and moving towards a fully unjobbed life. So I hope you enjoy the episode, and thanks so much for listening. The concept of that one sort of bullseye career direction just isn't, it's just not working. So, and staying gainfully employed is, it, it's kind of like an acidic fog, you know, it, it wears, it wears you out uh, such that in the evening, you just don't have the energy to devote to something really large. So the idea is, well, what can we start that are small things? and. One of the ideas for passive income I was thinking of, and Charlotte's pretty good at this too, is monetized blogs. I thought that would be a, a, an interesting uh, way of at least starting the trickle of revenue outside of work. You know, and right, right. The, the, in general, the idea, the direction of travel that you want to be moving in is, is towards like getting away from the, the nine to five. Yeah. Yeah, essentially, on a larger scale, being able to uh, earn an income and travel. Right. That's that's more or less the bigger goal. Uh, being able to travel while earning an income, or traveling as a part of earning an income, or whatever. Right. But the, the, just being able to spend, uh, you know, at least a few months at a time in different places around the world. Uh, I've got a recommendation for you, Greg, which is a book by Rolf Potts called Vagabonding, which I've read, and it's on exactly this topic of uh, basically purposeful long-term travel rather than, you know, a vacation for, like, one week of the year. Yeah, pretty sure. Vagabonding. Yeah, vagabonding. Yeah. It's a good word. But basically, yeah, and he talks about how... First of all, if you're traveling to other parts of the world, it can start, depending on where you are, it's, it's actually going to be quite a bit cheaper. Cheaper than living just day to day in uh, a first world country. Um, you know, just generally things, things are cheaper. So, so basically what it is, is the go and live in the woods plan. But go and live in the woods in a developing country. Yes. It's cheaper there. <laughs> yeah, that's, that is part of it. I mean, if you're going to work abroad, for example, a lot of people find it very fulfilling to, you know, experience another country by teaching English as a foreign language. I mean, that's a very, very common uh, thing people do. Uh, it's accessible. You know, you don't need that many skills to be able to, to take it up and find employment that way. It's quite in demand. Um, and that will sustain you in the country. It certainly won't, you won't be able to make savings in order to fund more travel that way. But I think the approach that Rolf Potts takes towards it, because he does this, he also lives, practice what he pre practices what he preaches uh, as well, because he sort of works to earn his freedom, as it were. So he like lives, uh, you know, lives on the cheap, but also, you know, work, doing overtime, this kind of thing, so that they can then f like fund travel in a place where it's cheap, basically. So limiting his time that he spends in America because it's quite expensive to live there. Well, well, it's a great, uh, it's a great reference. I'll, uh, I'll check that book out for sure. I mean, there's, there's also other stuff you can do besides living in hostels. I mean, you can. Um, you can go and teach English, which usually, you know, people give you accommodation, and you can go and be, you know, caretaker in other people's houses. I mean, they basically pay you to stay in a hotel um, as opposed to, to you paying to stay in a hotel. I mean, there's there's all kinds of things. It's just I, I think that the, the bottom line with all of these suggestions um, just in the on-job area is that you have to be um, flexible and not kind of take... Um, well, I need this this creature comfort or that one, and then not take that for granted. Right, right. I, I think one of the one of the joys to be had after reading this book is exploring, just being creative. Not necessarily thinking that you're going to find just one solution to this problem of, you know, making a living. 
Um, because yeah, and essentially the whole point he's making is that that's the yeah. paradigm that people have. That's the, yeah. the that's the ideology is like, what's my job going to be yeah. to pay the bills? And exactly. he's saying, well, screw having a job. Just get money from wherever you can. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't matter if that's five things or 50 things. If yeah. you pay the bills, then job done. And I guess here we've identified, like, the big thing you need to get your head around, which is if I'm going to, like, leave my, you know, uh, comfortable, reliable nine to five, nine to five to 65, or whatever the phrase, <laughs> the phrase is, um, then how am I going to find another, like, just as reliable replacement? But you won't necessarily find one. That's that's kind of the point. I have I know someone in my life who is living, like, they work from home and they, you know, earn quite a fair amount of money, actually. Um, and that's my violin teacher. Like, once a week I go around her house and she's got a room at the back that she dedicates just to teaching people piano and violin. Cash and in hand, I'm guessing. Cash in hand. Cash in hand, yeah. And so that's pretty, I mean, it's a pretty sweet life right there. So if I could get to the point where I can play violin well enough, like grade eight, and teach it to other people, then, you know, that that's one opportunity. I might not want to do that my whole life. It's um, the more skills you have, I guess, to share, then, you know, the stronger a position you're in. So, like, I think anyone reading this book is going to feel nervous um, about unjobbing. Like, anyone's going to feel like, you know, they've currently got um, financial stability. It's predictable. They know that even though they're budgeting month to month, you know, you can, you're already so habituated to budget that way that, you know, you will feel nervous if your income is suddenly unreliable. Variable. Yeah, variable. Yeah, but it's um, it's just something new. It's something something to try, but something that you know it could stimulate creativity. And if you can stimulate that, then maybe you'll that will sort of seep out into other areas of your life. So it generally feels more fulfilled or fulfilling. Rather than, you know, work is something that sort of feeds you emotionally rather than drains you. And so I think that even if you might find, even if it's not reliable or even if it's not predictable or secure, you know, it has so many other qualities that it's worth the risk. On on that uh, point about creativity and uh, just doing what you love, like you, you mentioned you were taking violin lessons it reminded me of the 2005 commencement from uh, Steve Jobs where he talks about he when he quit college he just kind of bummed around for a while and then took a uh, he took a course in uh, typography and calligraphy uh, at a local community college after dropping out of university and he knew it wasn't gonna at the time when he took it, he knew it didn't have any practical value to him at all, but he said he took it just because he was really interested in it and he loved it. And uh, some years later, when he and Waz were uh, designing the Mac, um, all, that, all that knowledge about uh, typography uh, eventually ended up being one of the biggest selling points of the, of the Macintosh when it was first released. Was uh, natural fonts, yeah, and none of that would have been uh, possible. Yeah, that wasn't a, for. That's an awesome speech, that one, and uh, and I remember that point as well. It's a lovely, it's a really great speech, and and uh, and it's a really great um, sort of example of how, you know, if you just do stuff that you love doing, then it somehow it all comes together as being valuable <laughs> in the end. You know, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, I think the the core point being though is that don't don't necessarily cross anything off um, because even if you think in the moment that it's not something valuable to you, you know, you never know. Like down the road, it might be, which isn't the same thing as saying that you should take everything all the time. But just just to say that uh, just because you deprioritize something. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be crossed off a list, right? That 
trusting your gut and taking and doing something that seems completely out of left field, it has a pretty high chance of um, coming back and being valuable to you uh, in some other endeavor on down the road. Well, I was just going to say, like, I mean, I, I've, they can I kind of swap places over the last couple of months because he's quit his job and I've got a new one, so I'm now working like <laughs> jobbing forty plus hours a week, <laughs> and um, like that's not going to be forever. Obviously, that's just the sort of short term thing. But um, this is called rejobbing. Yeah, I'm rejobbing. <laughs> but the new job I've just started has actually, I think I've only been able to do it because of things like that. But I, things that I've done in the past, I haven't actually seen any use for at the time. It's just been things that I've enjoyed. And it actually, it's just all, all these separate things have kind of come together and they will help me get this job, which is something that I, I find really fulfilling now and I'm really enjoying. And, you know, it's great, basically. So, I mean, I, I would totally agree with the whole the whole theory that if you if you enjoy doing something, just do it. Don't think about whether it's valuable now, because ultimately, it you know, it might be valuable later. It might not be. But, but it's valuable in the sense that you're enjoying. Yeah, so exactly. It's valuable exactly. to you. One of, one of the things I was doing earlier in the course, I was making a list of stuff that I'm doing now that I would do for free if I didn't have to work. Yeah, yeah. And actually, there's, there's only a couple of things I'm doing now that are not on the list, and I feel pretty good about that. So even though I'm working a lot, actually, it's all it's all stuff that I would do for free if, yeah. I, if I had that provision, like if I had savings and I didn't have to work for a while. I probably still want to do some, if not all, of this stuff but anyway. What do you think? It's like 80% or 90 or mm-hmm. So in terms of your overall time, what do you reckon? Just like, Obviously, just totally roughly. 70%. Well, that's 60, 70. 60, 70, yeah, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> pretty yeah. good. That's a much better percentage than me. What are you saying? <laughs> what are you on? My percentage, the percentage of my life that's actually spelt, especially of your working day, life, of my working life that you would do for free. That you would do for free. Zero. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think it's been really interesting listening to this conversation because when I left university, I definitely had this. Um, ingrained belief which is you know I have to have a career now mm. and I sort of thought about going into publishing and decided that I would hate it which I think is probably very accurate and so I sort of ended up just doing bits and pieces and I'm still kind of doing bits and pieces now and I think I always felt very self-conscious about that because people would say oh what do you do and I would really struggle to formulate an answer that was less than you know, a paragraph long. <laughs> right. Because you, basically, you have been an unjobber in many respects. Yeah, I haven't I, in the sense that, I haven't really in the sense that... I suppose uh, you haven't really... You, I've enjoyed you, it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you have in the sense that, like, if you haven't had, like, a fixed job and you had multiple sources of income, yeah. but some of them have still been money work, so to speak, as opposed yeah. to stuff that you really love. Yeah. But still, I mean, I think, you know, you, you, you have had like successfully supported yourself without doing the whole job thing for like a year and a half. Oh yeah, I certainly haven't done. I mean, this is the first time that I've ever had to be in work before mm. like twice. <laughs> so um, I think I've done pretty well not falling into the nine to five pattern because I have done, I did a, bits and pieces of that while I was at university and it's really soul destroying. I mean, mm. I just hated it so much. Yeah. And there are certain types of office environment that I just I had to leave after three days because I thought, no, I can't. I literally cannot do this. It's making me feel physically ill. And um, so I'm quite glad that I never fell into the nine to five thing. And I, I was really lucky because I did have a degree of flexibility and freedom in my day, which allowed me to do stuff I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And that was really nice. I really enjoyed that. And that actually, I think that kind of made up for not enjoying some of the work that I was doing. Or some of the stress that came with the instability. But, I mean, I I feel quite good reading this book now because I look at where I could have gone in life and I look at where I am and I think, had I not sort of done a lot of self-work over the last few years and everything, I probably would have ended up going into publishing or becoming a lawyer or doing something, you know, very, quote, successful and 
trying to be high powered and getting into the rat race and being super competitive and everything because I definitely have that streak. But I think, well, you had that indoctrination. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And it's all part of me, which and I think that's the part that was kind of self attacking over the last eighteen months. And it's like, well, you don't really have a career, so. And I, I felt kind of bad about that at times. Mm. And I think the whole self worth thing was tied up with that as well. But, but um, now I'm doing stuff that A, I know makes a difference to other people, which I feel good about. Um, and I think, yeah, because I enjoy it as well. I, I feel glad that I'm kind of, you know, I feel good about yeah. ticking the boxes. Absolutely. Well, you know, 60, 70%. You're, this, that's pretty damn yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> I feel now motivated after listening to this chat. Like, oh, um, I'm currently in an IT job, nine to five. Um, I know I don't like it. I know I'm not doing any big help for the world. And I, I have the option like, to rent my place and rent a smaller place. And if I'm really, 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 really cheap, I should be able to not do anything else. Uh, so I have free time to focus my energy on what I want to do. But it, it's scary. The, mm. the regular job and the security which I have now is, is, is really not great, but <laughs> comforting. And yeah. I, I, can, I can go to therapy. Uh, I can buy stuff which I wanted before and I can also spare some money. Mm. Save some money. Say, oh, sorry, save some money uh, in the future. And then there's the question, if I want to have kids at some point, will I be able, it, in current job, I will be able for sure provide for them. Yeah. But if I give it up and try different approaches and uh, diversify my income like will i be able will i be able to provide for my kids mm. at some point so that's tough call for me it's which, a very which... tough call it's a very I, I totally understand and, you know there's certainly the regular job has a purpose i mean it really does <laughs> yeah. it's uh, if it was that easy then um, to to give up jobbing then uh, i think a lot of people more people would do it it's, I think it's really scary, and also it's it's not simple sometimes in, in terms of how you then work towards. As you say, you know, if you now you have no dependents, you 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 are a single man, so you don't have a, a any a family to take care of, whatever. But you're thinking ahead to the future and stuff. You know, I, so I completely understand it. I think it's a a tough call, and I mean the only thing, like I guess. The, some of the planning things in here might be a good place to, to start before you do anything, just to think about it more. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, it's obviously not something to just do on Monday morning. Back to work. Okay, screw you. <laughs> I quit. Yeah. Well, hang yeah. on a minute. How much rent can I get for my place? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, for now, the plan is just keeping keep the job I have for a couple of months, and so that I'm there for a year, and I can turn back for it. Like it's a safe safeguard. Um, it sounds good on resume. Mm. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I like I really I feel self conscious about talking about the fact that I don't work anymore because i don't want to brag and make you guys feel bad I, I, I do want to say like because i really hope that you think about ways in which you might be able to do this for yourself whether it's through entrepreneurship which is the course that i took whether it's through the more kind of like thrifty version which is the course that this guy's in this book because from the other side i tell you it's fantastic it is absolutely like the best thing that you can do and Obviously, I totally understand the thoughts about children and the need for provide. I think it's very honourable that you think about those things because they're really important too. But I certainly pay a, a price in terms of the amount of work that I put in in the entrepreneurship time, and I did not have good years some of the during that period. But getting to the point where I'm not working now. I'm working every day on doing the psychology podcast, which I love on journaling, 
on spending time with Hannah, who I love. And, you know, so basically I get to do everything that I want, <laughs> you know. And so I would say this is something to really invest time in thinking about and planning for and in being passionate about making it happen because this is worthwhile. It yeah. really is, you know, there's a lot of bullshit that you can waste time on, but working out how to get to a point in your life where you don't have to work for other people and do boring stuff that you don't want to do, that's a really important project, and it so is worth it. So that's my, you know, yeah. sales pitch for going for unjobbing. <laughs> okay, thanks. And I, I wish sometimes that I'm, I'm some simpler kind of life form, which would not have the capacity <laughs> to consider long-term and short-term benefits. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I will, I will think about it more. Thanks. And there is that cultural meme, isn't there, which you talked about, Jake, whereby the rest of the world wants to pull you back into yeah. the right place. Well, you yeah. actually experienced that, didn't you, where people and just, were quite jealous of the fact that you were just leaving that. Right? Yeah, I, I got a very negative response from the people who, uh, at the company that I worked for when I left. You know, I think it was two responses. The first was like, oh, wow, you know, that sounds like a lovely thing to do. You know, the sort of, you know, imagining me sitting on a beach, I think, you know. Mm. And, and, they, and then there was another response, which was basically, yeah, I think it provoked a lot of, a lot of resentment. And, uh, you know, it was, that was tough because... Uh, Resentment from a whole group of people is quite uh, uncomfortable situation to be. Absolutely, and the thing I think probably where that was coming from is that they they were in a position where they had the car and the house and the mortgage and the kids and the you know perhaps even the the nanny and you know and probably the alimony payments from the first from the first marriage (laughs) and the maintenance from the first marriage and yeah and um you don't have any of that and that's probably. It's sort of the compared to what thing, right? It's like um, you're providing a point of comparison whereby they can look at their own life choices and think, did I really need to do all this? Oh, mm. wait, no. Actually, I didn't. Mm. Mm. And I totally remember Sunday nights where, you know, Steph talked about the, the sort of melancholy of Sunday nights yeah. before Monday mornings, and I really had that. I mean, yeah. you know, it's like, mm. shit to get ready and go back in you know and right. that's such a downer i've noticed that about you as well you've, the way you've talked about it having problems like staying up late do, like doing but have you noticed the change since since you know the last yeah exactly months. and now it's very different you feel well you seem much more relaxed mm. like and <laughs> don't know what day of the week is <laughs> 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 Yeah, I've noticed that too, actually. Yeah, it leads to planning problems when Hannah tells you to meet her someday. Hannah says she doesn't know what every week is. She doesn't quite write her. Right, right, right. I've noticed as well the change that you do see, like, enormously relaxed now, way, way more so than you did before. Mm. And a lot happier as well, generally, just a lot more content with life, and it's really great to see. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's still, it, it, it also brings up a lot of anxiety too. Because, mm. like, shit, is this going to be challenged by any threats from my old company? Or is this going to, they're going to be problems that are going to take this away from me? You know, it's like, finally, I've got here, you know, to the promised land. Is something going to go wrong? It's like, it, there's, there's definitely right. some anxiety because I'm not used to this. And mm. I think. It's, yeah, and uh, it's partly growth anxiety too, I guess. Yeah, or maybe. But that's that's a big part of this. Is because you because deep down you kind of get that if you live a life where you're creatively uh, coming up with solutions of where you can get the next bit of income from, then you know there's you're going to experience that growth anxiety. You're going to have to work through that and process that on some level to be able to cope. Uh, with an unjobbed life and so that's one one of the 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 binding factors i guess like one, one binding factor that i have at the moment is just debt yeah like i kind and of, of course, there's, to, like there's no way like some of those things you, you do just have to 
Cloud, yeah, yeah cloud you can't necessarily yeah. unjob your way through paying off debt. <laughs> exactly. pay, you need to pay that money like yeah. in a relatively short time. But, but the difference would be that if I were to carry on along the rails that I've sort of laid ahead of myself, I would carry on uh, spending a lot of money and earning a lot of money. But after reading this book, what my approach is now going to be over the next few my so the next six month plan is going to be to really, really cut back on my spending just so I can get rid of this burden of debt and actually you know, be, free free of it. be free of that. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm so I, I feel comfortable knowing that I'm going to spend the next six months <laughs> basically just working away on the grind. Oh, um, I've been there, I know how it feels, and um, yeah, I, I do feel for you. Cause, well, I, I, those but, are in lo- more long-term situations than me, yeah, so I feel yeah, grateful. Yeah, actually, you, you got out pretty well in terms of yeah. student debt, because you yeah. could have gone through and done the undergraduate degree and then done a postgraduate yeah. degree and this got is, this what this and, is what, and ended up with an yeah. absolute shed load I, debt. I just need to remind myself to kick myself, because whenever I feel guilty for flunking my degree and withdrawing from my my, my undergraduate um i just need to remember well okay so what were my two options i could either have got out like halfway through my second year of a degree with you know one and a half years worth of debt and no piece of paper or i could have forced myself through another two and a half years with, in, in some, more debt. with like yeah with masses more debt uh, a piece of paper at the end of it which i would then resent because i know that i was forcing my way through but it wasn't fulfilling yeah <laughs> sorry hannah's just raising her hand yeah. <laughs> but you have used yours for specific um, i'm job really time use my piece of paper even in your freelance work i could have done it without it frankly. right i mean i didn't i think it gave me some credibility but i think if I really wanted to, I could have done it without it. Yeah. Um, that was... I've got my piece of paper, damn it. <laughs> yeah, that was... I'm on my debt. <laughs> I was just thinking about, um, like, this, this idea of having any kind of alternative career uh, or, or uh, working lifestyle. Uh, it's only, like, come up as an, a, an option that I ever considered in the last year or two. Probably even some of the people that I really saw for the first time that kind of thing um i I remember when i was growing up in my family everyone worked a nine to five entrepreneurship was something that is you know just unfathomably complex it requires some skill that that every man can never attain and and so um it's interesting for me to think about how that very specific kind of template was, was set in my family environment and how I, I grew up with that for a long time. I don't know if that was other people's experience as well, but I think that's such a great point because I, I certainly know that for me, there were just no entrepreneurs even. When I grew up, the adults were all in jobs. And so, you know, entrepreneurship itself was, was rare, but also unjobbing. I mean, that was basically uh, the only thing I knew about that was it's there was some um, sort of quote losers who didn't have a proper job yeah and uh who were looked down upon yeah i had a similar upbringing yeah i think there's this this weird conflation with uh unjobbing and unemployment right yeah right yeah yeah Yeah, like i know two people at least who have met one of which is a housemate um who basically see being on the dole as like take like taking government benefits as unjobbing effectively like which like, it's not so it's, it's really really not it's living it's, at the expense of other people yeah and and it's not a plan for your life either it's not doing yeah living by your values unless those i suppose unless those are your values yeah and if those are you but i don't think they would actually admit to them those being their values like i value living at the expense of other people because I can because I can I'm, I'm more important than them and no yeah. I, I think they'd I think their reaction would be to be dishonest about that mm-hmm. yeah 
With regards to uh, what you were saying about kind of entrepreneurship and other people's uh, experiences um, with it, or with, or with kind of family history and so forth, I mean, I, I've seen people criticize those who've kind of had failures in entrepreneurship, and I think that sometimes that the the fear of of, of other people judging you when you try and fail. I think that sometimes might play a role in some people's experience. I mean, I've certainly, I think one of my uncles has tried a number of things and that, that haven't gone right. And I think there's people who, who judge him for it, but I, I mean, it's, I think that that sort of thing can make certain individuals who are very influenced by that less inclined or have increased anxiety over the thought of starting a new project. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I mean, entrepreneurship, I think, with it comes a lot more risk than a typical kind of job. That's that's part of the nature of entrepreneurship. And there's such incredible like fear and resistance to failure in in our culture um, right. and, and being being small and, and all those things that really act uh, against what is needed to be an entrepreneur, I think. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And I think people are very averse to taking risks as well because there's a lot of stigma attached to taking a risk and it not working out. Like I'm really reluctant to use the word failing because I think that's also part of that stigma. But generally, I think if people take a risk and, for example, set up a business and it doesn't work out, then they do come under a lot of judgment from other people, even if those are people that haven't necessarily taken that same risk themselves. And it is generally seen as a negative thing. All right, peeps. Thank you so much for um, coming along to the book club. It was really, really good fun. Fantastic call, Jake. Thanks for hosting. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great rest of weekend and look forward to talking to you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.